Constantinople was designed to be the center of the Christian world, the center of Christ's government on earth. These great cups were made to hold the mystery of Christ's blood inside the city's churches. Churches glowing with Roman gold and ancient holy images. Images that for a thousand years flooded right through Europe and the East. This, then, is Byzantium's first story, the story of how, in two short centuries, a dream was made. The dream that was Byzantium. Constantine, the Christian emperor, the man who took the faith of Jesus and the God of Abraham and created the beginning of the governments and churches in which the West still trusts. He was crowned, they say, at York in England in 306. For 40 years, he had killed foes and family alike, and when he died, people were so frightened of him that no one touched his body for a week. This was the extent of Constantine's ambition. The late Roman Empire, with Constantinople, not Rome, as its capital. And in the far north, in Germany, the city of Trier, a great imperial garrison. It still shows something of what ancient Constantinople used to look like. The city gate, still guarding the main road into town. great grim gate. Like the rest of the northern frontier, Trier was continuously threatened by Huns and Goths and Vandals and a dozen other warrior nations. Constantine the Great, the Emperor himself, would have walked down this same passage 1600 years ago. These vaults and arches are the architecture of his time. Once you are through the gate, central hall of government, great Constantine himself would have sat, where now the altars of Christian churches stand, because this is basically the same building. In the year 360, Constantine's son, built a magnificent church at Constantinople, especially for the drama of imperial communion. Next door, those same pious emperors built a giant racetrack, the Hippodrome. You can still see part of its outline in the streets. And here at last, around this old Egyptian obelisk, you can discover something of the atmosphere of ancient Constantinople the heart of old Byzantium. This stone's like a giant mirror, reflecting all the life that once went on around it. There's the emperor and his family, Constantine's successors, come to the royal box to start a chariot race. There's the obelisk in the middle of the racetrack, and the chariots too, eight of them running all at once. You need a lot of luck to win. This place wasn't just a racetrack, though. This is a place where people met the emperor and his court. It's the air, the space of Byzantium. A hundred thousand people roaring as new emperors are presented to them, as captives from foreign wars are brought and thrown at the feet of the emperor. It's the old parliament. It's the real heart of Byzantium. And that scene there, where have you seen it before? Look at it carefully. The emperor is in the middle with his family, just like God. Around them stand the army and the court, just like the saints. Beneath them, begging mercy, are Byzantium's enemies, the damned. It's a grand last judgment right here on earth with the emperor playing God. 
So that's it, really. The Emperor brings happiness and harmony. The theater brings luck and victory. This is the center of the world, an image, you might say, of heaven on Earth. So if we'd have pushed open the gates of the Imperial Palace that once stood beside the Hippodrome, we'd have really been opening the earthly gates of paradise. Arcades of gold and marble, silver boats on pools of mercury, silk carpets, golden thrones in halls of porphyry and pearls. All are gone. Only echoes of them still remain in Syria and Italy. Once, though, Constantinople held the palace of all palaces, the palace of the Christian Empire. Church, hippodrome, and palace. Constantine had made a sacred engine that would power Byzantium forever. Byzantium lost most of its European provinces. Only for a century, though. By the year 555, brand new Byzantine army had ruthlessly reconquered some of them. And in northern Italy at Ravenna, they left triumphant decorations in this church as their memorial. The man there is Justinian, the emperor who 200 years after Constantine completely remade the Roman Empire. The man who made Byzantium. He was a man, they said, who was gentle and approachable, a man who never showed his anger, a man who, in the quietest of voices, could order the death of thousands. He didn't organize the empire completely by himself, though. His great strength was as a manager. Those strong faces that surround him were the faces of a great team of men he'd picked together. And he didn't really care whether they were Roman patricians or from the humblest, roughest backgrounds. He himself actually come from a completely illiterate peasant family in Serbia. Justinian, though, was only half the picture. The other half was that most remarkable woman over there, the Empress Theodora. They'd married each other for love, and they stayed together for 25 years. And look at the young ladies of the court there. They're looking sideways and a bit nervous. You see, it's not proper for young girls to look straight at you, not unless you're a woman of power like Theodora. But that is actually a portrait of a woman dying of cancer. Within two or three months of this mosaic being finished, Theodora was dead. Justinian ruled for another 20 years. He never remarried, and he went to her grave and lit candles until he was a very old man. Though Justinian and Theodora restored the Roman Empire, this was no longer the ancient classical world. They lived in a different age, spoke Eastern Greek instead of Roman Latin, and viewed the world in very different ways. Look at these sculptures. They're probably the last classical figures ever made. They were made, actually, in the generations just before Justinian. Now, at first glance, you might think they're just part of those usual old classical things you see hanging around museums. Big stony Alexanders and Caesars all strutting their stuff. But they're not like that at all. They're new. They're different. Something else is going on. It's very simple work, very realistic in a way. Little light cut lines and a day old beard lightly chiseled on the hard marble as if to emphasize its transience, its insubstantiality. These people are pensive, sad and rather wise. After all, hadn't the saints and bishops told them that this life, this material world was only an illusion. 
So naturally, these statues don't strut their stony stuff like Alexander or the emperors of Rome. They are not heroic descriptions of skin and bone and straining muscle. Each man stands inside his own mysterious inner space that each one of us must occupy. And from that space, they look outwards from the soul towards the heavens. As you might expect, if you should move around them, the solid bulk of marble and humanity is seen to be nothing more than an illusion. was made for some of Theodora's favorite priests. It was probably the work of one Anthemius, a famous physician and mathematician. This was where the style began. Theodora built the church to hold the blood-stained cloaks and bodies of two martyred soldiers, Sergius and Bacchus, the army's patron saints. Now it's a mosque. Anthemia's subtle compass has transformed all the usual ancient forms. Squares become circles, circles octagons, and all around a single central point. Space spins into ever smaller spaces. It's as perfectly mysterious as the finest natural crystal. The walls, the columns, seem to be nothing more than an illusion and simply fade away. Just look at that great big glorious dome like a huge melon, divided into 16 sections and held by eight wonderful swinging arches on those extraordinary V-shaped pillars and 28 columns through the church. It's like a vast net of stone and brick slung over this central space, this strange, mysterious space for the Imperial Communion. It's a wonderful piece of architecture, and it solved all sorts of problems that you can't even see. You see, those low domes exert tremendous pressure, and there's a force in this building to push the bottom of it out so the whole thing comes crashing down. Now, Anthemius, like every other architect, has used stone here as lintels and beams as stress and strains, the old way of doing things. But he's come up with a brilliant idea to hold the church together, and it's this cornice. This huge, beautiful marble cornice with its inscription to Justinian and Theodora. This isn't just here for decoration. This links the church in a chain. It binds the stones together. A great necklace for the church brought from a shining island in a bright blue sea. to the holy city of Byzantium to be gathered up upon the site of the Imperial Communion. This is the finished dream, the tense climax of all of ancient engineering, a lively frame built with prayer and pragmatism to hold the largest dome the world had ever seen. This, though, is just the outside of a sacred theater. Inside 
a forest of columns rises up in ecstasy. The walls, glass and gold and marble, light and dark, insubstantial and illusory, seem to simply fade away. A perfect sea of space for God's holy wisdom to come down and touch the earth. A perfect theatre for the anthems of Byzantium. Lo, the lords of heaven and earth have come. Blood-red columns of Egyptian porphyry were taken, so it was said, from the Temple of the Sun at Rome. The church's wooden doors from Noah's Ark the building's bronze was stripped from the temple of the goddess Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the pagan world. No wonder the building has itself become a legend. Poets said, the church combined the size of sunset and the scale of quarries. The hues of birds and fish and precious stones. All the textures and experience of that ancient everyday. The living pink of baby's fingernails. The rising of the bright red star Arcturus. In Byzantine, in Greek, this church was called the Church of Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. All of Justinian's enormous empire, its wealth, its piety, its pagan heritage, was gathered up inside it. Throughout the next nine centuries, this vast old building stood right at the center of Byzantium a symbol of its true destiny on earth. And on the last day of Byzantium, the emperor and his troops came here to pray before they walked out onto the city walls to die. For these were the vaults that held the dream, the dream that was Byzantium.